Hello, my name is Professor Rachel Jean-Baptiste. I'm a faculty member in the Department of History at the University of California, Davis. I teach and do research on 20th century African history, particularly social history, interest in the study of women and gender, and how Africa is significant um, to global and world history. So today what I'd like to do is take the intersection of my research and teaching and talk to you about the Cold War and decolonization, Africa and global history. So the Cold War and decolonization, as many of you know, are two of the most important processes that take place in the late 20th century. And there are conventional narratives about these two processes that I'd like to disrupt by bringing in Africa into this story to make a more global and more truly global world history. So first, let me just tell you, summarize really briefly, what are the standard narratives about decolonization in world history? Using the key components of any time you're trying to tell a historical narrative of who, what, when, where, why, or how. So the story that we usually think about the Cold War is that there are a series of ideological tensions between the USA and the USSR, i.e. capitalism and Western Bloc countries versus communism and Eastern Bloc countries. And the Cold War is often called that um, because it wasn't really a war in the traditional sense in terms of fighting on the battlefields, but rather it was a war for hearts and minds in terms of the usual, the, the tactics, if you will, for espionage, cultural wars, and this lasted from about circa 1947 to about 1991. And that while the USA and the USSR divided the world, every other country had to basically decide where they fit in. And so where we see the Cold War enacting itself is this term that historians and scholars often use called proxy wars. In that, again, there was not this armed conflict, um, but rather it was the race to see who would get nuclear weapons, espionage, the space race, and also in terms of thinking about popular culture. And so the idea is that every nation Every society in the world had to decide which side you were on. And the drivers of this story are usually the USA and the USSR. So where Africa, or for that fact, Latin America, Asia, i.e. the rest of the world, usually enter into the narrative is that, again, they had to pick a side. And so the interests of these countries were not um, really relevant. So oftentimes during this time period, it's also what arose, what people may, quote, may call, quote, the third world or the global south, is that countries in Asia or Africa or parts of South America were just these sites in which the USA and the USSR um, played out their proxy wars, their own battle for world domination. And countries were just simply puppets and had to adhere one way or the other. So parallel to the Cold War that lasted from roughly 1947 to 1991 was this other very important 20th century global process called decolonization. And de decolonization, as many of you may have learned in your courses, is really around the world independence. And independence just means the process of receiving what on paper looks like um, the ability for countries to direct their own political, cultural, and economic um, futures and aspects. But really what I'd like to argue today is that we need to separate out what is independence, which is on paper, the ability to self-govern versus full sovereignty, which in this time period often meant that one would establish um, from a colony to something called an independent nation state. So sovereignty, what I like to argue, is really what decolonization is about. It's going from what looks like on paper, the ability to self-govern, to actually achieving it. So decolonization, then, is this process of receiving on paper independence plus real sovereignty. So this was mainly societies in Asia and Africa in the context of having European colonial rule, France, England, Portugal, and other European states, roughly the same time periods of the Cold War. So I'd like for you to look at the dates of the Cold War, 1947 to 1991, as well as the dates of decolonization, this period that we call decolonization, 
which was roughly speaking from 1945 to 1994. So parallel processes. And in terms of thinking about the how, independence comes about relatively peacefully in terms of strikes, demonstrations, writings, negotiations. Um, and there are also some wars of liberate, liberation, some violent um, efforts towards decolonization that involve um, sabotage, acts of terrorism on multiple sides in this, in this global story. Um, and to the point where we get to the kind of peak of this is the year of 1960, which is often referred to as the year of Africa, in that a vast number of African countries gain independence. So there's independence and then sovereignty, which is going to take several decades to come. So what often happens though, the fight for sovereignty then becomes the battle or the struggle for nations in Africa that have titular on paper independence to actually achieve real self-determination, real sovereignty, which is the ability to direct economic development, borders, political systems, cultural norms without foreign interfering, which is the process of nation building. So this is the kind of standard narrative that we have about these two important processes. So oftentimes, the standard historical question then that emerges from the standard narrative is the idea of how did Cold War tensions impact the goals and actions of African societies to define and achieve decolonization? And the emphasis often on this is on the Cold War side. It's this battle between the USSR and the USA that drives and shapes what African nations are often able to do. But what I'd like to argue today and what I'll suggest during the course of this lecture is that really this is not a, a, a historical question that is truly global and historically accurate because it pivots as if the USA and the USSR have all the power, they're the drivers of history. And what I, as an Africanist, as a person who teaches um, the particularities of African history and the significance in global history, want to pinpoint is that these are parallel processes and, although, and also parallel actions and ideas. And that what African countries want for decolonization influences Cold War tension. So really the historical question that we should be asking is one that reflects this accuracy. Is so questions such as to what extent did states control economic production through two important processes, the Cold War and decolonization in the 20th century? Another type of historical question is how did varied societies around the world negotiate the roles of women through two important contexts, the Cold War and decolonization? Yet another historical question could be, how did varied states around the world determine national identities through these um, processes, et cetera, et cetera. So you could fill in the blank with the particular historical focus that you want to have. But the important thing again is to look at parallel processes and how African states shape what the USA and the USSR does. So to get us to what I think is this more authentically global and more historically accurate question, what I really wanna focus on today is again, the kind of African drivers and African aspects of these two parallel processes. So the essential question that I'll be exploring today is how did the goals and actions of African leaders to achieve decolonization impact Cold War tensions. And so by, ex by exploring this particular aspect, what I'd like for you, those of you who are watching this to be able to do, is therefore to be able to answer that more historically accurate global question. So part of the reasons why, I mean, again, I've dedicated my whole career to studying Africa, but Africa is so important in world history because when we think about it, every single one of you watching um, this talk today are African and that it is in the continent of Africa that we have the, the origins of modern human beings. So it's really key to, to know and be able to know aspects of African history. So while I'm focusing on the actions and ideas of African leaders, I do want to acknowledge that there are asymmetrical relationships of power between individual countries on the African continent and the USA and the USSR in this time period. And that even though African states have aspirations, they aren't always able to achieve them precisely because there are times in which either the USA or the USSR seem to have greater political power, economic power, 
and therefore that um, results in African states not being able to achieve their directives. So I wanna focus in particularly on two case studies in Africa, because as we know, Africa is not a country, it is a continent with extremely diverse peoples, cultures, societies, and as a result, actions and ideas. So focus in particularly in West Africa, um, the country known today as Ghana, and then I'll take you um, briefly to Angola in West Central Africa. And these are the two case studies that I'll be focusing on today. Okay, so to the question of how did the polls and actions of African leaders to achieve decolonization impact Cold War tensions? I'm first gonna take you to Ghana. And even though I'll be giving this lecture, we'll be talking a lot about source materials and hopefully the other thing that you'll get from here is how do you read and interpret source materials, particularly images. Okay, so to Ghana. So I'll focus on how do we get from the colony of the Cold Coast to the country of Ghana and focusing in particular on the first leader of Ghana, independent Ghana, a person by the name of Kwame Nkrumah, who's an important global leader in the 20th century, the concept of pan-African unity and also non-alignment, which are key concepts to think about. So first I'll start off with an image. So this is Kwame Nkrumah, the first leader of independent Ghana. And I urge you to pause this video for a few seconds and look at how he's dressed and tell us and, and, and think, interpret for your own about what he, how he is dressed, what he's trying to convey. So pause for just one, a few seconds and think about your own interpretations. So Kwame Nkrumah in what he's wearing, he is a member of what is the minority ethnic group in Ghana called Fanti. And he also is raised as Catholic. So in his choosing to wear what is this cloth, which is called Kente cloth, which is a cloth that another ethno language group in Ghana um, that comes from them called Kente cloth, what he's trying to convey is that the Ghana is a heterogeneous um, nation put together by the um, willy nilly borders, if you will, of colonial states. They're trying to be one nation. And so by taking on the cultural garb or the cloth of this other ethnic group, he's really thinking about um, Ghanaian unity and having one national identity in this time period. And then also wearing a watch, which is a, a Western object um, up to a certain point. There's also the idea that Ghana, as it's about to come forth, has both, um, is gonna both incorporate Ghanaian African unity, as well as have some influences from um, the cultural history of, of the West. So Kwame Nkrumah is president from, is prime minister, I'm sorry, and, and then president from 1957 to 1966. And he also spent some very influential years that become influential for him in the United States and Britain. So in that, in the time in the United States that he spent, he got a degree, he attended Lincoln University, which is an HBCU, a historically black college and university. So a lot of interactions and debates with African-Americans. And in the years that he spends in Britain, meets African leaders from throughout the continent to also get the sense of what else is happening around the continent. So one of the key things that Kwame Nkrumah does in terms of thinking about the, the ways in which he impacts Cold War tensions is that he says the ideological battles between the USA and the USSR have nothing to do with the African continent. So what he does in being one of the proponents, not the only proponents, but one of the particular leaders of this um, idea that emerges called Pan-Africanism is that he says there is a common African identity across the entire continent. So what he proposes, there is a block other than the USA or the USSR, and that is the African block. So to a certain extent, he goes against this idea that Africa is a continent of multiple countries to think about really forwarding this idea of African unity. And there's three key events, three key moments that he is really the leader in organizing that really put forth this idea. So one is um, this event that takes place in Ghana called the All African People's Congress in 1958. And there's a motto for this event. And if you look at the leaflets for this event, they have a motto that says, hands off Africa, Africa must be free. 
And so the ideas that come out of this Congress is a call for majority rule throughout the African continent without violence. And the thing that's key to note, the time that it takes place, 1958, very few African countries have achieved political independence quite yet. So he's really saying that wherever there is European rule, there must be an end to colonialism. The other thing that comes up of this Congress is this call for African unity. So one of the tenets that comes out of the Pan-Africanism that Nkrumah proposes is this idea that there is an African personality, that no matter where you're from on the African continent, there's certain histories, certain traditions, certain culture traits that you share that give you an identity that is extra national, that goes beyond colonial or national borders. It's also this idea that there are to be free democracies in every African society, and this idea that there's pan-African socialism. So this isn't to say a Soviet socialism, a Chinese socialism, but an African idea of what socialism. So I will pause on this idea of socialism just for a bit, because I'll come back to this. And the other thing is to keep the Cold War out of Africa. That again, ideological battles between the USA and the USSR are not relevant because really the battle is to achieve independence and sovereignty. The key thing though about this, con this um, Congress that's going to ruffle the feathers of both the USA and the USSR is who he invites. So this con Congress doesn't involve only the people whom European states have uh, recognized as the leaders of independent nations, but also people who are agitating for African independence. So a key invitee is Patrice Lumumba, who is the head of a particular political party in the Belgian Congo. And Congo at this, at this point in time is um, actually, the colonial power is Belgian. So for him to invite people who are nationalist leaders who are agitating for nationalism, but that European powers have not yet um, uh, appointed, demonstrates how Kwame Nkrumah is saying, it doesn't matter who Europeans think should be the leaders of African nations, what really matters is who other Africans appoint. So this is the first event that kind of demonstrates the kind of pan-Africanism that Kwame Nkrumah wants to have. So we'll fast forward to the second manifestation of his idea of pan-Africanism, which is the Congo crisis that occurs in what used to be the Belgian Congo as it's gaining independence in the 1960s. So fast forward to two years later. And the only thing you need to know about this is as the Belgian Congo gains independence and it becomes called Congo, immediately there's civil strife in terms of some people in the Congo wanting to become a separate state from the Congo and others wanting to have a national the country to stay together. So Patrice Lumumba by this point is one of the leaders of the Congo in a power sharing agreement with another person, another party that the Belgians really want to be in power. So as the Belgian Congo is falling apart as a nation, as there's a secessionist movement, what Kwame Nkrumah wants is he wants for the Belgian Congo to stay unified as one country. And Belgium is not happy about this. The USSR is not happy about this. The USA is not happy about this because they too have their interests in terms of thinking about how Belgian Congo should be separate states. The other thing that he does is he advocates that it should be African soldiers and not foreign soldiers who should be intervening to either maintain peace and or have separate states. So he sends Ghanaian troops to serve in the UN forces. And in fact, he, he wants all foreign forces, all non-African forces, to not have a presence on the African continent. And the other thing that he does is he actually holds the UN responsible um, for some of the things that happen. So by the time we get to the end of December 1960, Patrice Lumumba, who is appointed as the first leader of the Belgian Congo, is murdered. And he is murdered by what appears to be other, other Congolese, but in the end, a few years later, there are all kinds of allegations that there was CIA involvement, Belgian involvement, and in fact, what occurred in the Congo was not determined by the Congolese, but rather by foreign intervention. So this is another manifestation of his Pan-African Pan -African, um, philosophy is that again, there should be no foreign involvement, but in fact, there is. The third manifestation of Kwame Nkrumah's um, Pan-Africanism occurs in 1963. So we'll fast forward to three years later, 
where there's a formation of what is called the Organization of um, African Unity, or in French, l'Organisation de l'Unité Africaine, which also points to the fact that there are multiple European languages that are spoken in African countries now. And so at a speech that he makes at this Congress, he calls for a single African currency. So there are no national currencies, but one that is used across the, con across the continent, a single citizenship, so that you're not a citizen just of Ghana or of Ethiopia or of Malawi, but rather you're a citizen of the continent of Africa. And he also says that there should be a unified foreign policy that the entire continent uses across singular countries and also a common market. So these are ideas of Pan-Africanism, as you may um, guess, that not only kind of uh, did both the USA and the USSR did not like, but also that some African countries in and of themselves had problems with in terms of wanting to maintain um, sovereignty. The other thing that he does is he condemns white minor European minority rule wherever it still exists um, on the continent, in particular South Africa and Rhodesia in this time period. So these are ideas that seem very radical to both um, Eastern Bloc and Western Bloc countries alike, because what he's really positing is that African interests and African actions and African goals are the most important and not what may be occurring um, in terms of what the USA and USSR is, are thinking that's important. So this is one manifestation of Pan-Africanism in Africa. The second way in which Kwame Nkrumah um, really um, battles against, if you will, this idea of the Cold War takes place in the United States. So I want to show you this next image. So I want you to literally pause this video when I'm, when I'm, when I'm done talking just for one second, because I'd like for you to think about who, what, when, where, why, and how. So this is Kwame Nkrumah in the center at the lectern, but I want you to guess where he is and some clues. And then I also would like for you to look at some of the posters that some of the people in the audience are, um, are, are holding. And so guess where he is. What are some of the signs that you see on the stage about where he may be? And also see if there's a particular person on the stage with him that's a very famous person in American history. So pause for one second and think about some of these things. Okay, so if you're back, here is um, the text about what's happening here. So Ghana President Kwame Nkrumah addresses a crowd in front of the Hotel Teresa in Harlem. And police estimate that the crowd is at 1,000 persons. And when you look at this image, the various um, ideas about when it took place, some people say 1958 and some people say 1960. So I hope in the time period when you were looking at this image and I asked you to look at some markers, some clues to where he may be, I hope you noticed the American flag to the right on the lectern. I hope some of you were able to recognize Malcolm X, who is a key spokesperson for the Nation of Islam, which is one organization that is founding a particular branch of, of um, African-American civil rights. And then a key person in the posters that people are holding is Patrice Lumumba, who is the first leader of uh, the Belgian of Congo, who is assassinated and murdered in 1960. So a second way in which Kwame Nkrumah battles against this idea that Cold War, Cold War tensions are supposed to be the primary drivers and um, the focus of African states is this idea of Pan-Africanism beyond Africa. So he calls for the idea of global blackness, that all African people, African descended people, anywhere in the world share common histories, and common futures about establishing their civil rights, their national rights, and their right to self-determination. So he says there are alliances between what African Americans are fighting for within the US and what Ghanaians and what is going on elsewhere on the African continent to achieve self-determination, sovereignty, and independence. And so this idea that struggles of African descended people anywhere in the world are supposed to be unified, they're the same, they're supposed to be helping each other, is really key because it intersects with what are burgeoning and strengthening um, civil rights movements in the US. However, where there are tensions between thinking about Cold War ideologies is that at this point in time in the US, the United States government, the FBI surveillance of civil rights leaders are highly suspicious 
that any civil rights leader, African American civil rights leader, is in fact communist. Um, and this is kind of the feeding of the Cold War ideology. So Malcolm X, for example, is someone who is surveyed, the FBI files about him. Um, and again, there's this idea that anyone who is any African American civil rights leader who is in conversation with Nkrumah is a communist, which are not things that are always brought out to be true, but rather, again, think about the Cold War ideology at this time and how these worries are, um, are stoked. So Kwame Nkrumah explicitly invites African American civil rights leaders, artists, and thought leaders to Ghana. And people such as W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Maya Angelou take him up on the offer. Martin Luther King had in fact attended the independence ceremony of Ghana in 1957, and Malcolm X before his assassination also visits Ghana. So this is the second way in which Kwame Nkrumah is deploying an alternative to Cold War ideologies. The third way that I'd like to talk to you about goes directly to the heart of addressing Cold War ideologies and the role of Ghana and African states in it. And so the next image um, is this another um, conference, if you will, that takes place. So pause the video for a second and see if beyond Kwame Nkrumah, you can discern or see who these other world leaders are in this photo. So if you are back. So this is um, a 1960 uh, conference that takes place in Yugoslavia in what is today, what people some people might consider to be Eastern Europe. And the other people in the photo besides Kwame Nkrumah are Nehru, the Prime Minister of India, Nasser, the President of United, what is Egypt today, as well as Sukarno of Indonesia, and President Tito of Yugoslavia. So this event is the Conference of Unaligned States, or it's also it can also be known as Non-Aligned Nations. So the third way then in which Kwame Nkrumah's ideologies kind of argue against this idea of this divide between the world is this idea of African and Asian solidarity that is a different yet another block that exists in spite of the USA, USSR um, divide of the world. So the idea is that un unaligned states and this idea of the non-aligned movement that really kind of take, to come to the forefront between the 1950s and 1960s is this idea is that not, it's, it's not that states are necessarily going to declare neutrality, but rather they're gonna say they take neither the side of the Soviet Union nor the USSR, because really what they're trying to um, offer this idea of, of peace. So there are precursors to this, and in that in Indonesia in 1955, there's a Bandung conference that occurred, where in reality, most of the nations are aligned with the US. But again, they're gonna say that we're not gonna take sides one way or the other. And the Kwame Nkrumah did not attend this event, again, it's, a, it's where the ideologies become in place and the foundation is set. Another conference that occurs that also sets up this foundation for what happens in 1960 is the African Asian People Solidarity Con Conference that takes place in Egypt in 1957. So by seeing all of these places where non-aligned conferences are occurring from Indonesia, Yugoslavia, um, to Egypt is the sense that countries are trying to negotiate a space for them to say that we as countries that are either former colonies, newly independent, trying to maintain sovereignty, trying to achieve economic development, have one common concerns that make it so that we have solidarity with each other and that we also are not gonna take an explicit side. So remember the idea of asymmetrical relations to power, this doesn't quite come true, but again, the desire is there. So the non-alignment movement is really these countries trying to say, we're just trying to establish peace in the world and establish our own self-determination and economic development. And that becomes really hard to do. So I've already given you what, the, um, what this next image is that you're going to see. So I hope you recognize by this point, Kwame Nkrumah to the left, and then President John F. Kennedy um, to the right. So in 1961, Kwame Nkrumah at this point has visited the US multiple times. He comes, um, he has a visit to the White House with John F. Kennedy. So I talked about Pan-Africanism on the African continent. 
pan-Africanism in terms of thinking about global blackness. And now I'd like to talk to you about a third way in which Kwame Nkrumah is trying to um, really play both sides of, of what is the Cold War ideology. So a third alternative to Kwame Nkrumah is this idea that he's gonna play both sides. While avowing the idea that he's not aligned, he's going to both solicit aid and cooperation from both the US and the USSR, which is going to throw a lot of confusion and suspicion by both countries with him and what he's trying to do. So at times, the American government accuses him of being a communist. And yet there are times when Russian leaders or the leaders of USSR accuse him of being a capitalist. And that's because he's deliberately, again, playing both sides. Both sides to get at the sense of what are Ghanaian interests and Ghanaian um, desires at this time. So let's go back a couple of years to 1957, which is the year in which Ghana gains on paper independence. So at this point, Ghana's future looks really bright. It's, it's a very um, wealthy country in that it has a lot of sources of cocoa. It's one of the world's largest cocoa producers, gold. Um, and the future is bright and that Kwame Nkrumah sees economic sovereignty and economic wealth for Ghana is really being based in industrialization. He doesn't want Ghana to be one of those countries that's just exporting raw materials. He wants Ghana to be a country that has the raw materials, is actually processing them to the point where it can export goods that gain more money on the international market. The other thing that's key for Ghana, for Kwame Nkrumah, I should say, and his plans for Ghanaian economic independence is that he wants Ghana to be able to have access to control the means of transportation. So he starts a shipping line called, and actually purchases um, uh, transportation that can, again, uh, ship the raw materials to Europe, to the Americas, as opposed to European shipping companies do this, doing this. He starts a shipping company called the Black Star Line that today is the, is the, um, is the inspiration for what the, the, the soccer team of Ghana, the football team of Ghana is, is often called the Black Stars. And the other thing that he endeavors to do is to bring nuclear energy, not nuclear weapons, but nuclear energy for the provision of energy for Ghana and starts off this project to have an atomic reactor um, imported and maintained in Ghana. So this is, these are his goals. Now, in order to do those, though, he acknowledges that Ghana needs um, foreign aid, they need money, they need investment, because Ghana simply does not have enough capital. That is the condition of many colonies. And where he plays both sides is that he seeks investment from both Soviets and Americans alike. But obviously, the, the USSR nor the USA are happy about this in the Cold War, where they want people to pick a clear side. So here's where Kwame Nkrumah then befuddles both the USA and the USSR. So he argues that what his economic policies and directives are, are what he calls a non-aligned socialism. So there are times when he avows and he says that he believes in the principles of socialism, but he also argues that it is one that is not necessarily aligned with Soviet and or Chinese ideas. And he also says he wants a free market system. So he is a proponent of capitalism and the idea that individual contributors are maintaining the wealth. And yet to add even more kind of, not necessarily confusion, but just he's taking and choosing and picking from what he thinks are the best of economic policies. And he wants state capitalism, right? So you may think, what is state capitalism? Because the very essence of capitalism is this idea that we have individual contributors. But these are Kwame Nkrumah's ideas that confuse and anger both Eastern and Western Bloc countries alike. So in some ways he has these, what looks like socialist policies and that he has state directed um, industries. So he nationalized some industries. So the shipping line that he starts is not one that is necessarily controlled by individual contributors, but by the state. He also has many three-year plans, five-year plans that he, um, issues that look very much like what was going on in the Soviet Union or China. So what he does constantly is he shifts his alliance between the USA and the USSR. He seeks and he actually gets investment from both. And the key thing is between 1961 and 1965, he has several large industrial projects that he wants and he seeks aids and aid again from both sides of what is supposed to be the Cold War divide.
So I'll give you one example of this. So one example of this, and we still exist in, in Ghana today, is this large infrastructural project called the Akosombo Dam that exists in a river called the Volta River. And this is a hydroelectric plant that he had built um, in order to provide a lot of the electricity that goes for aluminum mining and processing. So in the end, the investment for the Akosombo Dam, 25% of it comes from the USA, the UK and private companies. And this comes about, for if you're looking at this image, this meeting that he had with JFK, in which the Americans realized that they needed to invest and give investment to countries such as Ghana in order to kind of buttress against what is Soviet interest in, um, in what's happening in African countries. And it also has a lot of um, multinational, uh, Italy is involved in this project, and a lot of the investment comes from Ghana. So this is the way in which he's seeking investors from all over the world. However, what Kwame Nkrumah is also doing in 1961 is that he is seeking and receives investment and he is negotiating with the USSR and Eastern Bloc countries. And in turn, the USSR is courting him. So the way I want us to shift from the idea that somewhere that somehow Eastern Bloc countries are really the drivers in this, in this story is that the USSR is also very, very anxious about currying favor with African countries and getting them to become aligned with them. And the USSR is also worried about Kwame Nkrumah because he's a capitalist and that's what he avows. He's avowing a form of socialism that is also not quite in keeping with what USSR ideologies are. So what occurs in, 19, in 1961, the very year that he visited the White House, Kwame Nkrumah also goes on the tour of Eastern Europe and he proclaims solidarity with the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. Again, in the very same year in which he had gone to the, to the USA and, and proclaimed solidarity there. So after this time period, remember Kwame Nkrumah, oftentimes it's how he's dressed in the cultural symbols of, of how he's dressed and how he portrays what his ideologies are. Sometimes he begins to be pictured in a Mao style suit which is an image that many of you have seen broadly in various world history textbooks. So sometimes he's wearing the kente cloth of, of the Ashanti in Ghana. Sometimes he's wearing a Western business style suit in this picture with Kennedy, and other times he's wearing a Mao style suit. And in 1962, he's awarded the Lenin Peace Prize by the USSR, which again for the USA becomes a symbol of how he has really gone um, to the Eastern Bloc camp. But Kwame Nkrumah, again, is constantly playing both sides of, of, of the game, if you will. To the extent that we get to the 1960s in which there's money, equipment, education and training, so that let's say many of the doctors, people who are medical doctors in Ghana were trained in, in Yugoslavia, in Russia, and that some of the, the endeavor to build the atomic reactor, for example, has expertise um, from Russian physicists and Ghanaians are going to the USSR and other Eastern Bloc countries um, to gain uh, training and education. So you have multiple cultural influences and cultural factors going on in Ghana. So another way though, so this is where I'm gonna take you back to this idea that remember there are asymmetrical relationships of power that are operating. That as much as Kwame Nkrumah is trying to really forward the idea that African countries can independently decide what they're going to do, what their futures are. There are times in which the political power of the USA or the SSR, the amount of money that they have, get to the point where in the end, Ghana and really Kwame Nkrumah cannot truly determine what's going to happen in his own country. So let's start off with this image. So as we've been doing um, so far, um, I'd like for you to pause this video and think about who what, when, where, why this image and how this image may be taking place. Okay, so if you're back, let's look at what some of the signs say. So the sign says, Ghana does not love Nkrumah, therefore he must go. Or Ghana, tell all the truth about thousands of men and women detained. Ghana, parliament, jaded and dying, the United Party, free elections. So you have a sense that this is at least um, sometime after 1964. 
So what this image is, so it takes place in December uh, 1963, and protesters, Ghanaians, protesters, are in England outside of the offices of the, of the Ghana High Commission in London. So this is a diplomatic post, or if you will, the embassy of Ghana um, in England. And so what people are protesting against is that there's supposed to be elections that are happening in Ghana in 1964. And they're also saying that Kwame Nkrumah should no longer be the leader of Ghana. So there's almost like a revolt and protest within um, his own country and by his own countrymen about his continued governance. So how and why is this occurring? So fast forward to a few years later. By 1966, the Ghanaian economy is, is bankrupt. So the estimation is that Ghana at this point is $1 billion in debt. So remember that Kwame Nkrumah had this dream that Ghana was going to industrialize. He planned a lot of large industrial projects, Akosumbo Dam being one of them, and all of this took a lot of money that was not given, but loaned by various countries. The price of cocoa is the lowest it has been in the 20th century. So this really kind of star item that Ghana was producing, it's no longer gaining the prices um, that it was getting on the market, on the global market um, three years earlier. The other thing that's occurring that these posters are referring to is by the time we get to 1966, Kwame Nkrumah has become a dictator. What used to be a multi-party government, remember when he has the 1958 and 1963 All People's Conferences, he says that every African country should be democratic and there should be free democratic countries, is not the reality for Ghana. There is now, it's now a one-party state. His party only is the one that's allowed. Many journalists are arrested, beaten, tortured, and no longer allowed to cover what is truly happening. And so what occurs in 19, and then the other thing that you can see from this poster is Ghana Parliament free elections 1964, is that many Ghanaians don't even believe that the upcoming elections are really gonna be true and free. And so they start calling for him to step down, to have other people in power. And he doesn't do that, repression occurs. So what occurs in 1966 is that there's a bloodless coup um, to while he is actually traveling in China, incurring further favor and further efforts to get aid, while he is in China, a coup occurs in Ghana. And this coup is led by um, soldiers and police, but also civilian leaders. Some of the people in his very own cabinet supported this coup occurring. But here's where we get the kind of Cold War intersection in this. So the allegations, and we don't know this yet. So one of the things that often happens with Unit 8 histories, because it's such recent history, a lot of the research hasn't been done, documents have not been declassified, and so we can't really yet know what is happening. But there are many allegations that um, the coup that occurs has the support of the CIA and British support. So where the Cold War intersects with this is the idea that the USA, as well as people within Ghana, becoming increasingly uncomfortable and alarmed by the way in which Ghana is currying favor with the USSR, with China, say this can no longer be. And as US interest is in what's going on in African countries also increases, there's direct interference, direct intervention by foreign powers. So one of the things that begins to occur then in this kind of Cold War, the intersection between the Cold War and decolonization is that as much as varied African countries may be occurring great favor with either the USSR or the USA, the USSR and the USA are also having a stronger hand in what's going on internally in purposely for the purpose of forwarding their own interests. So this idea of the proxy wars um, is what you see. But the thing I also want to you know, push back against that narrative is to say that African countries are also trying to get their own interests. And so Kwame Nkrumah is playing that game and it's not a successful one at this time because it does result in his, in his ouster. So I've taken you through the case study of Ghana in terms of trying to elucidate the ways in which the actions and the ideals of African states um, impacted the Cold War, impacted Cold War ideologies, and in fact made it so that the USA and the USSR had to juggle and change based on those actions and ideas by African states. So the final case study that I'll take you through, and this one will be a lot um, quicker just because there isn't as much um, information known yet. 
So we were in Ghana in West Africa is to go to Angola in what's known as West Central Africa, just to make it geographically um, a bit more accessible to do African history. So I'll take you back to the essential question I'm exploring is how did the goals and actions of African leaders to achieve decolonization impact Cold War attention? Again, remembering that there's somehow asymmetrical relationships of power between individual African countries and the USA and the USSR. So in terms of thinking about where we go with thinking about Angola's role in this. So um, before I talk about this image, so Angola, um, at the time it gained independence in the 1970s, so much later than Ghana, goes from being called the Congo, which is a colony of Portugal, to Angola. And the key kind of terms here are the roles of African women, military conflict, and socialism. And so I begin with this photo of um, this Congolese woman because one of the things that we need to think about, I hope that you noticed um, in kind of some of the images that I took you through to Ghana, is that there's really a focus. It seems like it was just men. African men were the only ones who were the actors in this parallel um, processes or context of the Cold War and decolonization. But that simply was not the case. And so this image is of uh, a, a female political ruler um, in what was the Congo historically in the 17th century named Nzinga. So her name is either spelled what looks like Njinga, but it's, he pronounces her name Nzinga. And she ruled what were states that existed historically in the Congo of the Ndogo and Matamba states or kingdoms. And what's key here is that in West Central Africa, in the historical Congo, there's a tradition of women as rulers women as the directors of armies or military forces and conquest and the slave trade. Um, and that she wasn't the only one. I can name several others. Um, but again, think about this tradition and this history and this foundation uh, that existed historically that is therefore going to impact what the Cold War and decolonization looks like in the Congo from here. So we'll fast forward to the 19th century where the Congo has now become um, a, a colony of Portugal. So one of the things to think about though, is that they mentioned how the 1960s was the year of Africa, which was not the same everywhere. So the exception to African countries gaining independence is, I'm sorry, African colonies gaining independence and becoming independent countries is where there is a large majority of white European settler rule. And in colonies where there are large numbers of Europeans, independence and therefore sovereignty comes about later. It involves a lot of um, violent conflict and it takes much longer. And so this is where we'll talk about a different story about decolonization and the Cold War. And I'll start again with an image. So take a look at this image and see if you can um, understand the words, first of all, and if you can see, think about where this image is, who, what, when, where, why, and how. So pause for a second. So if you've come back, I can tell you that this is an image that really tells us a lot about Angola's path to decolonization. And so this is a mural that is in Luanda, which is the capital city of Angola today. And the people in the mural are Neto, who was the first president of Angola, and he's in power from 1975 to 1979. And then Fidel Castro, who was the president of Cuba from 1976 to 2008. And what the mural says is Angola and Cuba unify, uni, unified or unity in revolution. So what's key about um, thinking about the ways in which decolonization and the Cold War intersect in the story of Angola is the way in which Castro was a communist leader. So he was aligned with the USSR and Neto at times did align himself with socialism. But the key thing here is that it's not the USSR that is driving the kind of Cold War ideology but rather it's Cuba. 
So this is a really, really complex history, and I won't go into the vast amount of details here because the story is still um, being written. But the key aspects to know are that by the time we get to the, by the time we get to 1975, we're really the where Angola gains independence. One of the reasons why this is so complex is because there are multiple factions within Angola that are fighting and struggling with each other to become the party that is going to rule, the party that is going to determine independence. And the reason why this is important to know is that even though we often think of these ideas of socialism or communism as ideas that come from Russia that are really propagated by let's say China in terms of having their own ideas, I really want to impress upon you that there are African ideas also of what socialism means. So rather than getting away from this idea that somehow ideas of socialism are something that Russia or China dump on African countries, the Africans themselves are debating what socialism means, how they want to implement it. And again, this idea that Nkrumah had of what is African socialism. And so this is also one of the things that the Angolan civil war is about, is will socialism be the dominant political and economic ideology. So the thing to think about is the MPLA, which is the party of Neto, which is the party that become in control, if you will, in 1975 to 1979, when Angola becomes independent, that it is Cuba and it is Castro who is really intervening. And there's a partnership, if you will, or intervention support between him and Neto, between him and the MPLA, in order to fight this battle and gain control. So there are tens of thousands of, of Cuban troops, military intervention, lots of money and weapons that are sent to Angola that are decades and decades that are part of this battle for the MPLA to gain power and remain in power until the 1990s. And so the Soviet Union, was not even aware that Castro was going to do this. And at some point in time, they do begin to support him. But this is really driven by the idea of Castro that Angola, as a former colony, that there are commonalities that people have because they're both colonies fighting against domination. And this is what supersedes the kind of idea of Cold War ideology. And that there, that there are also the USA and South Africa are also intervening in this, but really think about one way in which you see the kind of Cold War side of socialism, if you will, battling in a way that is really particular. It's really African actions and forces and desires and goals that are driving this. So here's the history that is still yet to be done and the ways in which the kind of standard narrative even of Angolan, of Angolan independence and the intersections between decolonization and um, the Cold War has have yet to be written. So even though we see this mural of Neto and um, Castro, in reality, when you look at images that come from the Angolan battle, there are an awful lot of women here. So these are two images. So this one is of an Angolan MPLA, which is the, um, the socialist informed um, party that gains, uh, that, is becomes, that becomes the rulers of Angola for, for that period of 1975 to 79 when Neto is in power and beyond. So when looking at the image on the right, it's a bunch of Angolan women who are holding weapons and dressed in military, military gear. So the organization of Angolan women, or OMA, is a branch, is an arm of the MPLA. Women are trained as soldiers. Women are writing propaganda. Women are nurses. Women are growing food. They're carrying weapons. They're carrying food. They're part of the battles, if you will. And the image on the left is another one of an all male um, troop and a single woman, uh, one woman who was also holding a weapon. So women are really key fighters in this. We have another image of both Cuban and Angolan soldiers. So for the tens of thousands of soldiers that um, Cuba sends, there are also a lot of women um, present. And so what I'd like to suggest is there's a history and a foundation to Angolan women being political rulers, being the um, people who are also uh, organizing military campaigns that I think also feeds into what this 20th century battle looks like. And that is a history that is still to be um, written. So this is the Angola story. So to conclude, I've really sought in this um, talk 
to bring Africa into this uh, history of decolonization and the Cold War to make for a more truly authentically global and also frankly just a more historically accurate um, idea of how these parallel contexts are. So the question that I focused on is having the goals and action of African leaders to achieve decolonization impact Cold War tensions. And I hope that having begun to fill in a little bit, a tiny slice of, of this history, because again, remember that Africa is a continent and not a country. So I gave you two very small um, case studies and there's still many more countries to explore. So I hope I haven't given you a little bit of, of, of this history. We can get to the point where we can more accurately have historical questions that instead talk about how they varied societies around the world negotiate economic production and or fill in the blank of whatever topic area that you're interested in through two important processes, the Cold War and decolonization in the 20th century. And this is truly the historical question that gets at this at the sense of how multiple regions, states, societies all have a role in, in how this 20th century history of the Cold War and decolonization are written. So to learn more, here, in, here are some sources where you can consult to get more about these various sides of these histories um, in the African continent, um, to just deepen your knowledge from here. And I'd just like to end by saying thank you for watching this talk.